Welcome all. Quick audio check and we'll get rolling in just a minute. A hundred and counting and flying past, soon to be 200. Great. Uh, we have an absolutely incredible event for you this evening. This is really uh, a whole new format, uh, a great compilation of uh, really some pretty miraculous stories and examples over the past three plus years through the craziness that has been the pandemic and beyond and now into the wildness of inflation and economies, et cetera. Uh, here we are, April of 2023, and it is uh, an incredible course tonight for employee theft, negligent hiring, and disastrous transitions, examples from your peers. A uh, couple of quick components here as we begin. We have some support on the chat. Sheila is there to help answer any questions uh, and make sure that uh, keeping everybody uh, engaged and alive and sharing some great best practices as we go through. As a reminder, Q&A is also open, so feel free to ask some of those key questions, and we'll cover that in our Q&A section uh, beyond. Uh, this is a CE course, so please make sure that you've added all your specific information in. There'll be a survey at the end, and uh, certainly that is for the live attendees, not for any recordings, and please allow for about 10 days to process the CE credits. Okay, we have a, an incredible course tonight. I know many of you have already reached out with specific questions about, I just happen to have this nightmare employee situation, Adrian. I can't wait for it. Uh, David, I've had some concerns with some odd behavior from some of my staff, right? As well as, you know what, I am thinking towards transitioning and my God, I don't know what I should do within my lease agreement. So it is my true privilege uh, as we run through to introduce my three co-hosts this evening. First of all, David Harris is the rule rule breaker in his youth. David changed his direction and has spent much of his adult life in the world of investigation and enforcement. So if you've seen the movie, uh, it is just like that forensic accountant. So that is David's daily life as he crisscrosses the, uh, the universe here to help support the dental community, to help understand the criminal thought process and help educate and protect dentists. Uh, David's the CEO of Prosperident, the world's largest firm investigating financial crimes committed against dentists. He's the author of the book, Dental Embezzlement, The Art of Theft and the Science of Control, and over 30 articles in dental publications. Uh, David is a licensed private investigator, a forensic certified public accountant, and a certified fraud examiner. David, an absolute privilege to have you on this evening. Thanks for joining us. Great to be with you. And Adrian, if there's one similar point of feedback from every doctor, from Anchorage to Honolulu to Key West and Halifax and everything in between, it is definitely staffing, staffing, staffing. And I'm putting up with stuff because I can't get a hygienist into the office. I can't retain staff. I'm paying big bonuses and I'm still dealing with all sorts of frustration. So Adrian Twig is our subject matter expert on that. She's the principal and co-owner of Bent Erickson and Associates and an HR compliant consultant, having both the experience of managing a large dental group practice with 35 team members. Oh, that sounds like a lot of work. For over 17 years and working with dentists across the country, Adrian brings a positive proven uh, approach to solving everyday employee related challenges, strengthening the team she's presented nationally. She's joining us from Miami tonight after presenting twice already today. God bless you for being here. She's a member of the Seattle Study Club, Speakers Bureau, Society for Human Resource Management, American Association for Dental Office Managers, and uh, a truly incredible speaker everywhere. Uh, and myself, I'm your, your humble expert on dental office lease negotiations. And uh, it's my privilege here on behalf of Sirius Consulting Group to share what we have seen as the good, the bad, and the ugly of what landlords now are doing uh, to really impact and impede. And unfortunately, there has been some nightmare transition types of scenarios. So uh, a quick introductory poll as we go through, just to get a quick sense of everybody in the room. Uh, I know we've got a few hundred here. Uh, just help, we'll help to try to customize some of our content this evening about a little bit of background on yourself. Are you applying to, planning to build or relocate, to acquire, planning to transition uh, and sell the practice potentially in the next five years? 
you know what, I'm just planning on hunkering in and staying put or none of the above. Uh, also the stage of your career, right? Many of you might be, you know, I'm just about to wrap it up and hang up the coat, David, right? Or Adrian, I've just opened my very first clinic and my office manager doesn't want to sign an employment contract. So from side to side, we'll keep that poll up for a minute. We appreciate that. Uh, and then I'll cover on those shortly. So really, <coughs> excuse me, the three points of this evening is embezzlement. What do you need to know in 2023 from David Harris? Hiring, who do you love? Who do you keep, right? And who do you grow with? Uh, and myself in terms of minimizing risk and the dental office lease. So on that note, I'll stop sharing here and pass it over to the David Harris. When and you David, stop you sharing the when you stop sharing the sharing button moved. You're messing <laughs> with me. And just uh, just to kick off, we've got about still got lots of people adding in, but David, we've got about ten percent, eleven percent that are early stage, roughly uh, thirty seven percent are mid career and later stage, and then about fifteen percent are either a, a clinic leader or a non non doctor. Perfect. Great. Well, welcome everybody. Um, what I'm going to do tonight is a little bit different from what I've done in past serious webinars. I'm going to present a single situation, and you can see the title there. We're going to introduce you to a doctor and a thief and an investigator from Prosperident. And uh, fortunately, the doctor will be with us on video to, to tell a lot of the story. Um, here he is. His name is Dr. David Hughes, a wonderful guy, great clinician. He's an orthodontist in Virginia. And uh, he had the misfortune to employ this woman, whose name is Lisa Anselm, for a long time, um, 15 years or so. And more or less out of the blue, he called me one day and said, you know, something doesn't feel right. And I have the feeling that my, my longtime, very trusted office manager might be up to something. Uh, there's, there's one more actor in our trilogy. There she is. Uh, her name is Wendy Askins, and Wendy is what's called a supervising examiner with Prosperident. She's been with us for over a decade, and Wendy has a couple of distinctions. The first distinction is that she has found more embezzled dollars than any of our other investigators. The second thing is she has received more letters of commendation from clients than all of our other investigators combined. So. Wendy is 100% uh, the total package, and uh, she specializes in orthodontic embezzlement investigations, so it was, it was logical that she be assigned to this file. Um, so now we're going to watch Dr. Hughes by video, and we've got three or four slides, each with, uh, with a, a little different aspect of, of what happened to him. So let's let David tell his story. And as the investigation continued, I was, I was floored, absolutely floored by the extent of the embezzlement and the, the breadth of complexity of the multiple strategies being used in payroll and the company credit cards and the cash payments that were being diverted and the, the mirroring of things that we, like vendors and suppliers that we use, there were parallel accounts set up so that the credit card statement would have recognizable vendors, but those purchases were actually going toward personal purchases and Amazon. One thing we know about thieves is that we see very few one trick ponies. Almost every person who steals from a dental practice uses multiple methods. And that's what David was getting at, you know, and um, un unusually a lot of a lot of thieves will focus on revenue theft. In other words, stealing either patient payments or insurance payments. And one of the things that that marks Lisa Anselm, the embezzler in this case, is that she did that. But at the same time, she was also creating expenses that shouldn't have been there. So it it, it points to the. Um, the fact that embezzlers diversify just like you would diversify money in your 401k. Another really common theme with embezzlement is manipulation, gaslighting, if you like, where 
thieves try to control how their doctors think. And um, David had some really interesting things to say about this. One thing that embezzlers do, as I've learned, is that they they convince the doctor that they're irreplaceable. And that's a that's an absolute red flag for people that know better and are alert to this. And believe me, I beat myself up about all of these these di different weaknesses that I had and were obvious to her. But she saw that I was watching certain things and not other things. And honestly, the embezzlement went on for about five years. It just things were not adding up to me. But she would always say, "Oh, it's it's understandable. Our you know the costs have gone up." A lot to unpack from that manipulation and one one really common factor that we see with thieves is territoriality and by territoriality i mean possessiveness about their duties and it'll even extend to their workspace and we we heard a little bit of that coming across from david the other thing that we heard of course was that when he went to lisa and said you know things things don't seem right she always had a good answer for him Another thing that David found out the hard way is that he thought that his accountant was doing a lot more to protect him than the accountant really was. And you know, one of the one of the interesting characteristics of dental practice when we compare it to any other kind of business is that your accounting is actually split into two parts. In other words, you have practice management software that looks after revenue and you have QuickBooks or some other kind of accounting software that looks after expenses, and the two of them really don't talk to each other. When your accountant does their work, especially in the US, and it's a little bit different in Canada, but in the US, when the accountant does their work, they don't need to even look at your practice management software. They can do everything that needs to be done from your bank statement and your QuickBooks or your other accounting software. Whereas most of the bodies that are buried in dental embezzlement are buried on the revenue side, in other words, in practice management software. So let's uh, let's hear what David says about the, about the role of the accountants. I felt vulnerable, and I asked my accountants for an audit just to because there was a lot of money flowing in and out of the practice for the purpose of the you know the the debt service on this expansion um, renovation. I just wanted to make sure there were eyes on all of those transactions. And it was weird. I don't remember their response precisely, but they basically declined. Like that wasn't really their role. When you look at embezzlement globally, in other words, across all industries, including dentistry, but also including everything else, accountants find about 40% of it. When you narrow that focus just to dentistry, that number drops to about 9%. And that's really what, what David found out the hard way. I felt vulnerable and I asked my account. Whoops, little replay there, sorry. Um, and then the next question for David that I asked him was, well, what did you learn from this? And uh, he's he's got some great information here. Embezzlement, dealing with embezzlement is about prevention. I, I'm part of a an unenviable fraternity in my state with two other orthodontists that have had this happen to them. All three of us are speaking to our local societies to try to help others. You, you won't get your money back. You won't get your sleep back. Just prevent this from happening. Put the safeguards in place. It's like a patient comes to you and says, doctor, I'd like to spend the least money on my teeth in my lifetime. And if you're having that conversation with a patient, probably what you're going to do next is say, okay, become really good friends with your toothbrush and your dental floss and visit our hygienist as often as we tell you to, because that combination of things is a lot cheaper and a lot less intrusive than the alternative, which is what what happens to people when they when they neglect the basics and uh, David's advice about your practice is is equally good um, it is it is cheaper and far less painful to work on prevention than to clean up after 
So last month, uh, Lisa Anselm got, uh, got sentenced to three years in prison and was ordered to pay restitution of $200,000 to David Hughes. Um, both David and Wendy Askins, who, who was the lead investigator in the case, were in the courtroom when Lisa Anselm got sentenced. And they, they each uh, had something to say about their experience in the courtroom. So let's, uh, let's hear from them both. And it just felt like the justice system was doing um, justice to what happened. So it was, there was closure even before the verdict was read. There was a, an element of closure in just being heard and having the facts, the black and white numbers and facts um, presented to the court and read aloud by the judge. Um, I felt a lot of excitement just throughout the entire day, the excitement that this was the closing, hopefully, of one chapter for David, but the beginning of a new chapter for the thief who was now going to suffer the punishment for it. So that's how they felt after. Um, a few takeaways for all of you. The first one, and I suspect Adrian will have a little bit more to say about this, but I, I cannot overemphasize the importance of pre-employment screening. Um, one of the things that I've noticed about dentistry is that hiring decisions tend to get made with a, the benefit of a whole lot less information than what should happen. And I'm gonna throw out a really sobering statistic for the audience. If you live in the United States, uh, 70 million Americans, in other words, one in four adults has a criminal record. And yet I see countless practices that don't do the very basic criminal record check. Um, but it doesn't stop there either. It's important to talk to former employers. It's important to look at somebody's social media activity, um, probably in a lot of, situations, drug testing is something that should be considered as well. Um, there are a lot of things that need to happen before you bring somebody into that very important place called your practice. And it's really tempting right now when everybody's complaining about how hard it is to find people. It's really tempting to shortcut this stuff. And when you do that, sooner or later, you're going to get caught. The second important takeaway is financial oversight. And there's a lot I could say here. Um, but we'd all be here till midnight in whatever time zone you're in, so I'm going to just keep it short. Um, three quick takeaways. The first one is the reports you look at at the end of the day and at the end of the month should be ones that you printed yourself. As soon as you allow somebody to print those reports, you create a huge, huge possibility of deception. So I know there are a lot of doctors who would like to go through their whole career without learning the first thing about their practice management software. It's a really bad idea. Um, the second thing is a basic piece of math. The amount you collect should be the amount that you deposit. My suggestion would be to try to line this up monthly as opposed to doing it every day. What makes the daily, um, the daily comparison hard is that you have a lot of types of money coming in where the timing is different. In other words, if somebody pays you by credit card today, that's recorded as a, as a payment in your practice management software today, but it might not hit your bank account until um, the end of the week. So when you look at a month as opposed to a day, a lot of those timing differences have kind of self-resolved. Um, again, a lot more I could say about that, and, and I'm happy to answer any questions after. The third thing is articulation. And as soon as I say that, every dentist in the audience has this mental picture of the relationship that the mandible has with the maxilla. That's one kind of articulation. What I'm talking about is financial articulation. And the way financial articulation works is this. If you have, if your office is, was open 21 days this month and you have 21 end of day reports in your left hand, and you have one monthly summary report in your right hand, the totals of each of fees and payments and adjustments from the 21 reports should be exactly the same as the total on the month end summary report. 
if those things don't line up, in other words, if they don't articulate, then what happened is that somebody came in when the office was closed and pushed through some transactions that they clearly don't want you to see. So three quick takeaways. Again, happy to answer any questions after. And Adrian, I guess you're up. And we just pulled up a quick poll, which there'll be a survey towards the end as well. And David looks like he struck a chord. Over 76% of uh, survey people are looking for a follow-up call. So uh, lots of good questions through there through the Q&A. Again, guys, we're really going to dig into it at the end uh, to deep dive into these uh, while also after going through some key case studies. But uh, Sheila's on. We've got some great Q&A as well as we've got a chat that's just a flurry of activity from the uh, few hundred of uh, attendees we have right now. So on that note, Adrian, you should be able to share. Okay. And, and just if you share the full screen, Adrian, we should be able to see the full presentation versus the. Okay, got it. Perfect, got it, okay. looks great. Well, thanks for the opportunity to be on here. Um, as I have said before, I always learn things listening to David and Eric, you as well, when we uh, talk about these subjects, sometimes that are a little out of our scope, but we still need to know. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit on negligent hiring, um, give you a little bit of information about us. We're Ben Erickson and Associates, and we are we do human resources and employment compliance for the healthcare industry. We work exclusively with the healthcare industry. We've actually been in business for a little over 40 years, although I've not been here 40 years, but the business has been here with a stellar reputation, and HR is our specialty. We work in all 50 states. Um, in the United States. And as David was kind enough to remind me, we have a lot of um, participants tonight that are in Canada. And so some of the things that I may talk about may not apply to you in the province that you're in, but the bottom line is compliance and being careful and cautious about who you hire, the method and the ways that you go about it are going to apply regardless of maybe some of the laws or regulations that you may deal with. We're in a lot of different dental publications and we are the most trusted name in the profession for human resources for the field of dentistry. So there's a whole lot of um, different components when you talk about hiring. Tonight, we're really going to talk about reference and background checks and making sure that you've got everything uh, in, uh, all your T's crossed and your I's dotted so that when you go to hire that person, um, you know that that you you're covered and my slide is not advancing ad lib <laughs> might just be that i pulled up the poll adrian so maybe uh, give that yeah give yeah that it's good second. right now yeah it's Perfect. good so like i said we're going to really hone in on the reference in the background checking so um the statistics right now for uh, falsification on resumes and applications is astounding. You can, you can guarantee that about almost half of the information or um, some of the information on resumes and applications right now is false. They're adding whether it is the length of employment, maybe they are stretching the dates that they've been employed at a certain place, um, the salaries may be a little bit inflated. Right now, there are many states that legislation is up in the United States that as a prospective employer, you are not allowed to, add, to ask what the former uh, salary was. So that's one thing you need to be aware of. Um, I'm not sure about the provinces in Canada, if that has made it that far north yet. But just be aware if you're in the United States and you're wanting to know what a candidate 
uh, has made in the past, you need to be careful what state you're in because you could be under the legislation that says you can't ask about that. But some of the experience has certainly been inflated um, about what they have done, um, you know, what the, their uh, capabilities are and their education. We are astounded monthly about um, hygienists that are coming in and they don't even have a license or their license is expired, has not been renewed. But as far as it goes on their application and their resume, they're in good standing. So these are all things that you need to be aware of. You need to know how to go about checking them, making sure that what you're getting on that application and resume is absolutely in fact true. This is a case study that we've come across where there was an associate doctor that was seeing a patient and mistakenly prescribed the wrong medication for a, a patient. There was some pretty severe side effects and the patient came back and sued the doctor for malpractice and it actually came back on the employer because when things were run and the records were uh, looked into, the employer had not checked any previous references or anything on that doctor that he hired as an associate. And it came back to the employer as negligent hiring, which is exactly what we're talking about. Had that doctor done the extra steps, and I'm sure that it would have been more than one or two, um, he probably would have come across something in the references about that doctor. Um, even if he hadn't, he could have said that he had done his due diligence in checking references and doing those extra steps to make sure that um, he had gone the extra step to, to find out anything in the background about that associate that he was hiring. Another case study that we found was uh, a doctor had hired a new employee, had not done the reference check, had not talked to uh, previous employers. If she had, she would have found out that that employee had been let go because she had a violent temper and had gotten into altercations with other employees. There was some behavior where they suspected that maybe there was a drug issue or a drug problem there, but nothing was done. Due diligence was not done on the part of the employer. So there was an altercation and that new employee, unfortunately, did a pretty nasty right hook, I guess, caught the um, other employee in the face, ended up with a broken nose. That also resulted in negligent hiring um, when that employee that was hit and was hurt kind of dug into things and, and did some investigation on her own about that new employee. So it really is important that when you um, you start to look at your the applications and the resumes. You know, make sure that you're digging in and that you're getting good information on that. So the negligent hiring goes back to when when that employee that you've hired ends up in some type of violent act or some type of act that affects another employee as a personal injury or some type of damage to an employee that you have on staff. So the court determinations in this will go back on the employer to find out, so what employer, what doctor, what did you do to do your due diligence to find out what the background was on this employee? Did you check references? Did you um, call the former employees to make sure that the information that you got on that application was in fact true and it was provable for you before you hired that employee? And they're gonna ask, okay, was this a risk that had you done due diligence and had you run the reference checks and all that, that you could have discovered that? Well, certainly for uh, the employee that had the violent temper that was let go from the practice, 
that could have been discovered if they had been able to go through and do a reference check with the former employee. But like I said, due diligence wasn't done and that's how it ended up in court. So the court's gonna look at the potential liability. What was the liability with the um, hiring employer as far as going back and doing those reference checks and looking? So that's where the liability is gonna end up on the doctor that hired that person without the due diligence. So let's talk a little bit about conducting the reference checks. You know, we get a lot of questions about, well, you know, what and how, who can I call? What can I do? You know, what do I need to have? Well, the first thing we're going to recommend that you have is a signed release from that candidate that you can absolutely check the references. Um, if they're not willing to give you a release to do that, that may immediately put up a red flag that you need to think about. Um, and see you know, what's going on. Why would they not want you to check their references? And I apologize for a little bit of lag here. I am working from um, a hotel room instead of my home office. So um, waiting for my slides to advance. As you do, Adrian, interestingly on the poll results, uh, almost a 50-50 split to, do you have an up-to-date policy manual that was created by an HR professional? Uh, unfortunately, the no's have it. 52% no, 48% uh, yes. And then do you check references by speaking to a former employers on each new hire? Yes, 65. No, interestingly, 35%. Yeah, those are, those are pretty... Um scary statistics, especially for the ones that do not have a compliant up-to-date policy manual with the way things are changing at such a rapid pace right now, not having that policy manual that you can refer back to on a consistent basis is really something that I would um, implore everyone to get taken care of and not just borrowing um, your cousin that owns the hardware shop um, their policy manual. You need one that is pre that is um, pro produced by an HR professional that knows the laws, that knows the regulations that you're under, wherever you're located with the threshold, with the number of employees that you have. So having that policy manual is a huge critical component to having your HR covered. So um, hopefully my slides will advance now. So the next thing you need to think about when you're doing your reference checks is making sure that you're talking to the authorized source to give you the information. One thing that we recommend is if someone gives you a name of or a company to call and they just give you the person's name and a phone number, do a Google search. Make sure that the phone number that they give you is in fact connected to the business and is not maybe their best friend that you call and will give a glowing reference on that person. But do a Google search, contact or look up the business um, online to make sure that the number that you're calling is actually uh, who you need to talk to. Hopefully you can talk to the doctor, um, making sure that you're getting the authorized source with good, clear information. You're going to ask job-related questions, uh, things that can be verified so that when you ask the doctor or if the doctor has passed you off to an administrator or a bona fide practice manager, making sure that your questions are within the realm of the legal questions that you can ask. Uh, you're not gonna ask how old this person is. You're not gonna ask how many kids they have. You're going to ask job related questions. We've got some examples for you that I'll get to, but making sure that they're within the scope of legalities and job related along the line. Avoiding any type of pre offer questions that may come up, but once again, keeping them job related and that you're verifying the information that has been supplied to you, whether it's through the office manager 
or the doctor or anything that you have done as far as researching the company goes. Consistency is another thing that we recommend that you strive for, that you're asking the same questions of all candidates so that nobody can do anything in the way of discriminatory claims, but you are consistently asking the same questions to each candidate that you interview. Some of the sample questions that we recommend is something like, if you're talking to a former employer, so what's your evaluation of the competency level of which this person performed their duties? Um, that is a somewhat subjective, but at the same time, you're going to have, they're, they're gonna be able to tell you whether or not that person was able to perform the task, the duties and the responsibilities that he or she was assigned. Um, this one, if you're asking a former employee or a reference, um, would you describe them as being self-motivated? You know, if we ask the candidate that themselves. I mean, who in a job interview, if they're asked, are you self-motivated, is going to go, well, you know, every once in a while, I kind of need a kick here and there to get me going. That's not going to happen. But this is a good, good question to ask that employer. You know, did you find that they were able to look around and see what needed to be done without having to be told every single task or duty? that they did. So whether or not they were self-motivated is a good question. Um, especially if this is someone that is uh, working in the admin department, maybe greeting your patients or, or uh, at the front desk that has a lot of uh, duties about when the person enters your space. You know, how was their customer service skills? Did you feel like they were really connecting with your patients and making them feel welcome. Um, and then that can carry all the way back to the clinical team, you know, whether they were good at making the, the patients feel comfortable, relieving any anxieties that they may have. Asking how they were an effective member of the team. You know, did, did they get along with everyone? Were they somebody that kind of held the team together? Was their attendance satisfactory. You can certainly ask that because here again, this can be proven by your payroll records, by your time clock, you know, whether or not they were in on time, um, whether they had issues were showing up at all. And of course, the last question is one that is universal. It's would you rehire this person? If you start out with that questions, a lot of times, you may know your answer as to where you whether or not you go further down the path with this person. If somebody says, no, I would not hire this person back, that's definitely a red flag that you need to think about. Um, when we get into doing background checks, we certainly recommend that you do background checks on, on your people. Um, there are a lot of pediatric practices in some states now that are being required to have background checks done with their employees just because they work so closely with children. I know some offices and pediat pediatric practice practices don't want the parents going in the back with, with the child. Um, that's certainly uh, an area that maybe some parents would be concerned. Doing background checks in, in that area would certainly be called for and not a bad thing at all. But there again, make sure that you're keeping it job related. Um, the type of background check that you have is going to be, it's going to vary by state to state in the United States. And it probably will vary in Canada. David will probably be able to address that in the question and answer section. But the laws pertaining to credit reports and credit checks can be uh, pretty restrictive. Um, you want to make sure that if you're doing a credit check, it's related to their job. If you've got somebody at the front desk that is handling finances, handling money, boy, you're certainly going to make want to make sure that they are trustworthy, that they're reliable as much as you can if they're going to be handling your accounting and taking money and credit card information over the counter. So uh, the screening out portion of it is consistency. 
You know, if you knock one person out of the running for something, being consistent across the board there again, so you are avoiding any type of uh, discriminatory uh, issues that go along. So um, the selection process and the rejection process, make sure that, you know, it's apples and apples, oranges and oranges, and that your selection and rejection is based on the same criteria. So that once again, you don't run into uh, any type of discrimination and avoid creating any type of disparate impact against one person versus another. So we've gone through a really quick overview of that. And I think the bottom line is making sure that you've got great questions that you're asking every single um, candidate that you've got. Check your references. If you have to do some extra work into going online, going to the um, company and Googling it, making sure that you're doing that and you're talking to the correct person, somebody that is authorized to give you the information and authorized to um, say yay or nay, to you know give you any background information uh, if you have those signed uh, reference forms. A lot of times, whoever you talk to may request a copy of that release from the candidate saying that, yeah, it's okay to give that information out. That is completely normal. And so it, it helps for you to have your documentation in order. We are big on documentation at Bent Erickson and Associates. So having the documentation there, having signed authorization form certainly goes into it and helps you to do your due diligence and get away from any claims of negligent hiring. So that's it in a nutshell. So Eric, I will turn it back over to you. Well, Adrian, you've got at least seven or eight questions through the chat, plus another <laughs> probably half dozen or so on the Q&A, which we'll get to shortly. So uh, as we bring it to the third uh, pillar, thanks Adrian, it's lots of questions between North and South of the border that we'll dig into, uh, but ultimately a lot of good best practices. And that really brings us to here where, you know, ultimately there are three key numbers that you may be shocked can impact your saleability of the practice. So when we touch on now from embezzlement and employee theft to right? Negligent hiring and or disastrous hiring uh, fall one and the same. The third is those disastrous types of transitions. And that can be things such as passing away, right? And falling to the emergency exit where you're nearly needing to sell quickly. And stats are is that if you don't sell within the first 90 days, the likelihood of that practice selling falls to almost zero. But three quick numbers, 85% of dentists have a lease that can prevent them from ever selling the practice. So for the 74% of you that have a lease, right, there we'll touch on some of the core components that can be hiding in your lease. Now, especially post pandemic, what we see is that more often than not, especially as a lot of the office uh, nationally through Canada and the US, right, the office market is softening for rents. There are even more than 40% of dentists overpaying in rent. And as you'll see some examples and some videos of clients shortly, 80% of landlords actually have a lease that structures it, that they are entitled to a percentage of your sale price. Uh, meaning that when you sell, the landlord says that that is just as much their profit as it is yours for the blood, sweat, and tears. David continues to shake his, uh, shake his head over those. Staggering. Uh, for those of you that uh, as this is the first serious webinar you've attended, thank you, welcome, right? We've been at it now 29 years. We've done over 13,000 of these types of dental office lease negotiations, and we're the only healthcare dental specialized tenant advisory negotiation firm of our kind in North America. Uh, with that being said, uh, to really dig into some of the case studies. So these are some that actually I've pulled from some of the recent practice brokers. So Tom Schneider is head of Henry Schein's practice, trans, uh, uh, practice transitions team. And these were four recent examples that we went through um, recently. So number one, here was case number one. This was a situation in the Northeast US where the buyer was so frustrated through the process, walked away from the deal. Fully financed transaction, 
with a fully negotiated purchase agreement. However, at the 11th hour, they said, oh yeah, I forgot, I gotta assign the lease from the seller to the buyer. The landlord asked the seller to remain as the responsible party, also known as the continuing liability clause, on the purchaser's new lease for the seller's remaining term of the existing lease, which was two years, and for the term of the purchaser's lease, which was you know, eight years on top of that for 10 concurrent years. After eight, after weeks of negotiating, the landlord relents and only requires the seller to be a responsible party for two years. But through that period of time, the purchaser said, this is nuts. If they're making it so difficult for the seller, then there's no way that I want to get in here. So the buyer just walked away uh, and walked away from all of that issues, all because that lease wasn't structured in a way to allow for right, that continuing liability clause to be removed. So case study number two, financial strength of a purchaser. Now, you might be shocked to know that the landlord could have a clause in there that states that they have to be of the equivalent net worth of you on your exit when they are entering into the lease, an equivalent right, net worth. Well, how many associates are going to have the same net worth as you on your way out? So here's an example where the seller brought through a buyer to the landlord, right? Must have at least 50% of the net assets of the seller or the seller is liable for five years after the sale. After, after full price offers, over a year and a half of negotiations and offers were rejected by the landlord. Finally, a purchaser was found as a needle in the haystack who happened to, who happened to own her own practice and her real estate. So finally, the doctor could sell to finally find someone that was at least equivalent of half of her net worth. Number three, uh, month to month. For the 37 of you that are in a month to month lease, right? The 6% of you. Uh, case study number three, a month to month lease. One of the brokers had six candidates, six potential buyers, uh, where each potential seller had a month to month lease, thinking that their landlords would give them a favor and they, hey, I'm not tied into it and I can just walk away. But the sellers were shocked to learn that the purchaser would not buy, and more importantly, the lender, right? Especially the big guys, Bank of America, RBC, North of the Border, et cetera. If there's insufficient term on the lease, they will not issue a long-term loan. So if there's only five years worth of term, in some cases, the banks will only give five years worth of payback period. And obviously, if you're selling your practice for $2 million, there's no way an associate's going to be able to service that debt over that short period of time. Six potential sellers were unable to sell their practice uh, and had to walk away from their practices, all because of they left themselves very exposed with the month-to-month -month lease, which out, without the ability of selling the cash flow and that continuation of payroll. Key study number four, through the eyes of the purchaser which we are, all, we are all selfish as humans. We're all thinking about number one, right? Maybe not Adrian, but we're all thinking about number one. Uh, as a result, you need to start looking at your contracts through the eyes of the buyer. No different as your handbook through the eyes of the buyer, your employment agreement through the eyes of the buyer, and your lease through the eyes of the buyer. So in this particular case, buyer and seller got together, agreed on the sale price, agreed on the closing date, purchasers a corporate entity, right, had eight practices, strong balance sheet, right, the purchaser is also out of state and new to the market, landlord's a real estate trust, right, the big REITs, the big national guys, landlord initially laid an unrealistic set of expectations with the sellers to stay on for the remaining two years of the lease, purchaser was required to give a per corporate and a personal guarantee, right, attorneys, both sides, everybody started to, hey, we'll handle it, etc., but again, through all the back and forth, the landlord still wanted that pound of flesh through that personal and corporate guarantee. And the purchaser said, we're done, walked away. After spending $20,000 in legal fees and the buyer had already spent $9,000 in legal fees, all because of one little clause in the bottom of the, this section. So where does it go wrong? So for those of you, for the few hundred of you that are running through here and joining us this evening, this is where if you're following along on a digital copy of your lease, this assignment section is key. By definition, it describes 
right, the process as to if you can sell your practice, right, in alignment with assignment of the lease, which is usually one of the two conditions of sale. To sell your clinic, it's usually conditional to the buyer getting financing. And number two, right, the successful assignment of the lease, because how much is your practice worth without the keys? So therefore, this assignment clause clearly does break down when you can sell your practice, what the landlord's responsibilities are, right? What the conditions of that sale may be, right? And more importantly, right? What the actual continuing liability and financial aspects of it. So this is uh, a personal client of mine. Uh, Dr. O'Mara, Northern California, uh, came to me devastated, right? At 74 years of age, she was in a beautiful strip mall and the landlord owned right, another building, another, uh, another business in that strip mall and wanted her nice end cap space. So with similar language to the lease as we just described, the landlord had all the control as to whom she could sell to and when. She tried to sell her practice three separate times, one to her partner, right, one to an associate, and even one to a corporate buyer. Every time the landlord said no. So at 74 years of age, can you imagine this? Just to be able to reap the rewards from selling of her assets into her retirement, she was then forced to relocate 10 minutes north. Right? We were able to negotiate her, a, a, luckily, right, a great new agreement with a landlord that was very anxious to secure a medical dental tenant. And we got the landlord to cover 100% of those build out costs. Right? But can you imagine being 74 years of age and being forced to go through the headache of relocating all because of one little sentence, right? Hidden in Article 76, subsection 2 of your lease agreement, right? So as we look to that, this is what to look for, right? Number one is don't be surprised in your lease. This is in over 75% and this section's in almost 100%. The landlord must give you prior written consent to allow you to sell your practice. Number two, the landlord could say yes, the landlord can say no, or the landlord can say, you know what? I'm terminating your lease, effective of your closing date of when you plan to sell, retire, and move on, just for asking to sell your clinic and assign your lease, putting all the power back to the landlord. Oh, and they can also reset it back to market rent or 15% greater. Oh, and by the way, any difference between what you'd normally spend in rent versus your proceeds, the landlord is entitled to a percentage of those practice sale proceeds. And we have had four files across our desks in the past few months where the landlord has collected anywhere between 60 to $160,000 of consideration, money, cash from the doctor, just purely for the landlord's right to assign it from them to the corporate buyer or otherwise. As shocking as that is. And then arguably most importantly, which killed those previous three out of the four deals, right? As it states here, notwithstanding, but look out for those, the landlord's consent to any assignment or subletting the tenant shall not be released from its obligations under this lease and shall remain liable for any failure of the tenant or its assignees forever and ever amen. Meaning that you will remain as liable personally or corporately as you are today, even years after you've sold. A doctor who attended one of our courses uh, pre-COVID in Michigan raised his hand and said this exact thing happened to him. He retired in Florida, got a phone call years later. Unfortunately, the doctor he sold to was three months behind in rent and gone. The landlord said, unfortunately, because of the continuing liability, doctor, you remain liable and you remain liable, right, for not only the past three months, but the remaining four and a half years on the lease. The doctor called his office manager and had to reopen the clinic, had to get the band back together. One little clause, hundreds of thousands of dollars of liability, right? Uh, number two, and we've got a, a doctor here to share their story, one particular clause on the options. If there's two takeaways from tonight, Right. Number one is to add in into your calendar right now. When does your lease expire? And more importantly, when, if any, is your option to renew deadline? If you fail to miss that option to renew deadline, 
those remaining options become null and void and you right, have just become a month to month tenant. One little clause right, could be personal to you, right, that you don't have the, only you have the opportunity to renew the lease, not the buyer. Right? Or the landlord could put through a new standard form lease or the landlord can give all new rent right, at your expense. An example, recently out of Texas, uh, a doctor had reached out to us, got this, his friend right, was the doctor next door, thought it was his friend, golfing buddy, et cetera, right, got this letter, had built it five years prior, got this letter and said, unfortunately, as you know, your lease expired November 14th, 20, 2018. Right, you had an option to renew, but you were required to give me notice by six months prior to the expiration of your lease, which you did not do. However, please be advised, my broker will be placing a for lease sign, a conspicuous but non-intrusive place on the premises this week, and they'll only show you, share your premises you know, during business hours. Oh, lovely, right? How, oh, and if you wanna stay, have your people call my people. So this is a very similar situation what happened to a great client of ours and I'll share this from Dr. Uh, Dr. Thatcher here quickly. My name is Sam Thatcher. I'm a general dentist here in San Francisco and I'm also the team dentist for the San Francisco Giants. I've been practicing about 20 years. I've been in this space for 16 years. We actually started from scratch. This was an empty space and we started and we had a family friend who's an attorney look over the lease for us. Although we really didn't negotiate that much because we were just really excited to get in and start practicing. After practicing for 15 years, my lease was coming up for renewal and I actually missed the renewal deadline. So that made me pretty nervous and anxious about renegotiating a new lease with fair and affordable terms to protect me and my family. My Henry Schein sales rep, Ellen Hong, is the one who recommended Sirius Consulting Group to us. She's been our sales rep for years, and I really trust everything she recommends to us. So when Sirius looked over my lease, they found several major issues. The assignment clause gave my landlord the right to terminate my lease and throw me out of the practice if I tried to assign the practice to someone else. There's a clause in the lease that says that the owners are entitled to half of the funds from a sale. In other words, if I were to sell my practice for a million dollars, they would receive $500,000 of that. And the new owner, if they were to default, I would be on the hook financially. There was the relocation clause, which said that they could actually relocate this practice to somewhere else in the building at any time and I would be left on the hook uh, financially for that move. After reviewing the lease, it was a no-brainer to retain Cirrus to handle my lease negotiations. Cirrus was able to negotiate some very reasonable rental rates. They were also able to eliminate the relocation clause completely. They were also able to renegotiate the assignment clause. This took away my landlord's rights to any of the practice sale proceeds. It also took away their right to terminate the lease and it took me off the hook financially if the new owner were to default. Cirrus was also able to negotiate $6,000 in a tenant improvement allowance to allow me to remodel my space. They also negotiated a five-year option to renew and they gave me the ability to review any operating costs charged to me by the landlord to make sure I'm being charged fairly for any cam fees or other operating expenses. So from that perspective, you know, prime example, Dr. Peak of his career, thinking about now transitioning, et cetera, and all of that was going out the window all because of one little clause and just being busy, right? And forgetting to exercise that option. So if any of that has caught your attention and caught your concern, these are just some, great one to screenshot. This is a great component to look at just some of the clauses we typically focus on when we review leases, right, to help understand exactly where your red flags are. So at least now you can be clear and ideally have a negotiation treatment plan next time around. As we summarize and get to Q&A, number one is start early. The best time for those of you in a lease are starting at least 24 months in advance prior to your lease renewal. The earlier, the better. The more time you have, the more leverage. It's never too late, but the more time you have, the more leverage. It's up to 18 months to pick up and relocate. Number two, get all the information. Get uh, a digital copy of the original lease as well as any amendments, riders, exhibits. Number two is get all the information you need for goals, right? All the way through the process. Have your lease professionally reviewed, right? Get the average rental rates, 
And then number five is determine that carefully choreographed game of chess long before you do anything. But please don't pick up the phone tomorrow and say, I just watched Adrian and David and Eric and Mr. Landlord, what do you wanna charge me now? Far better to have a full carefully choreographed plan long before your very first move, then negotiate the business clauses, then negotiate financials. So from that perspective, uh, as we'll run through, a quick poll for all. So again, for those of you that have been, uh, eyes have been opened, right? For those of you that do uh, and do want a consultation with Ben Derrickson, ourselves, right? And Prosperinant, we've made it easy through the poll questions. Uh, and also we're here to help. I think the biggest point through all of these Q and A sections is you're not alone in all of this, right? My God, you've got done and invested heavily through the sacrifice, through dent dental school, through all the process, through all the financial investments, through all the headaches, right? To signing your first associate agreement, to signing your first employer agreement as the employer, let alone your first lease on the trunk of a car, right? Thinking that, oh, if I don't sign here today, I'm gonna have four other dentists that are gonna take that space, right? Or boy, just, you know what? I don't even wanna think about my office manager taking from me because my God, if I lose my office manager, right? Oh God, maybe it's almost worth it to look the other way. You're not alone in all this, right? If there's one key takeaway is that there are teams of specialists that do nothing but this, right? Who knew, who knew there was a dental office embezzlement firm that just does dental office embezzlement or dental office leases or dental office HR, right? So uh, again, it's a pleasure to help assemble this VIP cast uh, for those of you, again, we waive our fee and appreciation for your time, for the complimentary rental rates uh, and office lease review. Uh, I know roughly 65 of you had already requested it even before we had started the event. Um, so I wanted to get to some of those Q&A and truly uh, appreciate the great questions and feedback we've had here. And I see a lot of emails are already coming through. So um, from that perspective, uh, to now jump in into some of those Q&A. So Sheila, you've done a great job on the notes. I see there's lots of updates. David, you've been keeping in touch. David, you started first. I know you've seen a good swath of them for you. Uh, why don't you jump in first, David, in terms of some of the key questions and some of the outstanding ones that we can uh, address first. Um, absolutely. And um, I, I tried to answer as many as I, as I could directly while while everybody was talking, but um, some some people were looking for more specifics on embezzlement techniques. Um, I'm going to tell you that Prosperident just doesn't uh, do that in a public venue. Um, so if you if you do have that question, please feel free to uh, reach out to us after the webinar, and we can have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. But I'm just not going to comment here on specifics of how people steal. Um, Somebody asked to explain articulation again. I thought that was a great question. And if, if you, um, I, and I, I, rather than do it verbally, I just typed a, a written answer that you can see in the, um, in the Q and A, I made it public for everybody. Uh, and if you, if you wanna keep that answer, you can just copy it and paste it, or you can take a screenshot by, if you're on a Windows computer, doing the, the Windows button on your keyboard and print screen, that's how you, that's how you capture a, a, a screenshot. Um, I think those those were the key ones. There there were a number of questions that probably overlapped between Adrian and me a little bit, and there were really two recurring themes. One was negligent hiring, and the question was, um, is negligent hiring a thing in Canada? It absolutely is. Um, the the other question, and Adrian, please tackle this because I'm I'm sure you have a great answer. A lot of people seem to seem to think that they can't do anything other than confirm employment dates when they're a former employer and they're contacted by a prospective employer. Yeah, yeah, that is true. That is something that is like the myth that just goes on and on and on. There is certainly some wisdom and discretion that you need to use. Uh, one thing is, okay, do you have a release from this person that you can give a reference or, or that, uh, you can contact former employees. And at the same time, if you are calling a former employee 
about a candidate and you're asking questions that that former employer can substantiate, such as, was this person uh, on time? Did they miss a lot of work? Um, things like that, that the, like I mentioned before, that the payroll records can be brought up. And if that employer, the former employer gives you that information, they can prove that what they gave you was correct. Um, it takes away a lot of the liability, but there again, we're going to always recommend that you have a release by that person to call the references. And if they're going, going to give you references, then why wouldn't they sign a release? So um, there are a lot of questions that you can ask. I know, David, like you, like you said, many people are under the impression that, oh, well, all I can ask is, when did they work from you? Like date of hires and how long did they work? Or would, would you rehire this person? Um, and that's not true. You can get further information. Once again, I will reiterate, make sure you have a release from the person, um, an authorization to check references. But then the information that that former employer gives you, it can be substantiated with documentation. And that's always going to be important. So uh, yeah, there are questions that you can ask other than just the, would you rehire this person? And I'll, I'll amplify a little bit. Uh, 17 states give what's called qualified privilege. In other words, that, that is almost the same amount of sanctity as a conversation that you have with your lawyer or your priest or your doctor. So there's, there's qualified privilege in a lot of states for conversations between employees or between prospective employers and current or former employers. And in those cases, you, you can, as long as what you say is true and without malice and not discriminatory, there's nothing you can't say. And you can back it up. Yeah, that's the true part. That's the true part. Absolutely. We're big on documentation. So if you ever hear any of our presentations, we are going to pound you over the head with document, document, document. You know, just like. Eric will tell you in real estate, it goes back to your documentation and uh, in uh, HR, it is absolutely the same documentation for everything. That's, that's a good follow up. And there was a bit of a theme through that of sort of disbelief through some of the notes and some of the Q&A, but it's uh, especially young associates. I remember doing a CE course close to uh, your big event in October, Adrian, in Denver. And, you know, a prime example was, you know, some associates up front said, we're working for a corporation and said, oh, well, the landlord can't do that. The landlord can't do that. The landlord can't move me. The landlord can't, you know, hold me liable. The landlord can't kick me out. And there was a, an endodontist in the back. I'll never forget it. 62 years of age and just started roaring, roaring <laughs> and said, let me tell you what the landlord could do. I was forced to relocate three separate times right once as an associate and then twice should have loan, known better but all as a result that look if the landlord wants to you to walk in with a, a purple hat and with a feather in it and hop on one leg they can do so right this is the world's oldest profession the lord of the land and they can all the way down to the type of procedures you're doing we've seen orthodontists be able to negotiate exclusivity over the subspecialty of orthodontistry, phase one, phase two, Invisalign, et cetera, precluding then the GPs from offering that based on how the lease is structured. So literally down into that nitty gritty, you know, this, this yeah. isn't you signing a, you know, residential lease in college and thinking, ah, you know what, if the landlord's going to turn off the heat, the, the CD, you know, the news channel is going to show up and CNN is going to be here and it's, you know, going to be all right for the people. This is an agreement between two separate corporations, your PC, right, and the landlord, and it is all down into the T's and C's. So the reality of half of these questions that have been all flowing through is what's in your agreement, right? What's in your employment agreement? What's in your handbook, right? What does it specifically say within your lease? Yeah, we do um, in some of our pre-hiring forms in the packet of information that our clients get. We uh, give forms or we offer forms about giving referrals or giving references as part of our hiring package. So, um, you know, that kind of uh, sets, sets an um, kind of a, 
uh, precedent there that you have that form in the documentation so that if if it doesn't work out down the line and that employer employee goes somewhere else, you have the authorization to give references if they want to keep that. So um, like you said, Eric, it all comes down to the paperwork and what's in it and what's not. If one more thing I'll add, and, and um, I'm a little fussy about terminology here in one area. Um, I think criminal record check should be called exactly that. Background check means different things to different people. So I never use that in substitution for a criminal records check. Um, another question was asked, do you need um, an applicant's permission to, to conduct a criminal record check? And um, I think the answer is irrelevant. In other words, it doesn't matter whether you need it or not in your state. Should you get that permission? Absolutely, you should. And I'm going to go one step further. When you're posting a job, tell people what the scrutiny will be. In other words, if you're going to drug test, tell people that when you post the job. If you're going to do a criminal records check, if you're going to um, whatever else you're going to do, if you're going to look at social media, tell people that. Why? Because the best thing you can do is separate unsuitable applicants at the earliest possible moment. In other words, you don't want to get through the whole hiring process, find the exact person you like, and then say, oh, and by the way, we're going to drug test you and have them say, oh, well, maybe <laughs> this isn't the job for me. Yeah. At that point, you've invested a hell of a lot in a dead end. So when you, when you post a job, make very clear what the scrutiny will be and let the people who know they're going to have a problem with that scrutiny just weed themselves out. Save yourself some time. And stomach lining. <laughs> I will, if I can, David. We, there's, there's a lot of questions from employers on best practices here. I will say from, uh, specifically from having all of these great courses from David, as an employer myself, what I've specifically done based on David's recommendations from many of these courses, you can see through our YouTube channels or otherwise. Uh, but number one is I always get the corporate visa card statements now sent to my home versus to the corporate office, number one. Number two is I also get a copy and now know how to access the alarm code and in terms of who uses it and when. Uh, in our case, we have the um, individual pass keys so we can see who's using it when and who's accessing the office and when, right? And those, I know, David, you didn't want to get into any specifics, but just as one employer to the masses of other employers here, those are two little best practices that I've done, as well as obviously you know, keep every specific uh, alert and app on my phone. And I even trigger it so that any time the corporate card triggers something at 0 0.01 cents uh, for the personal card as well, to the chagrin of my wife. But needless to say, it does. Oh, Eric. Oh, oh stop, stop, stop. It's for the, just, it's for fraud prevention, fraud prevention. <laughs> <laughs> um, one final question, Dr. H. Um, uh, I had a clause authorizing my sale to practice to anyone in the health profession does not uh, not restricted to dentistry. I have a walkaway clause, but it states that I can sell as long as the profession is qualified in the area of expertise as long as it's health related. Yeah, uh, Dr. H, obviously a client of ours, and uh, I saw your note today. So looking forward to reconnecting with you as well uh, in my old hometown of uh, San Diego. So, yeah, happy to discuss. But obviously, we did some great work there to help give it as broad of a um, of a capture as well, so that depending on your situation, whom you want to sell to, right, the water, wider the audience, especially someone that wants to be multidisciplinary or otherwise, there's lots of options there. Uh, Sheila, anything else we've missed? David, Adrian? Nope, I, I, I'm good. I, I think that covers it. I, I did have a question from someone that was asking if we were going to talk about uh, hiring and employees quitting on this webinar. And I just offered for them to contact me directly and I'd be happy to answer any questions. One thing I'll mention that we've started doing, Adrian, that, that um, I find helps a lot. You know, a lot of employers are complaining about ghosting now. Oh, sure. words, you know, people applying and then not showing up for the interview or um, getting the job and not showing up. Um, one thing that that I did um, 
recently was when when people apply for a job with Prosperity now, we require them to make a one minute video on why they want the job. Hmm. And that does two things. It increases their investment because a lot of times people will post the job on somewhere like Indeed and there's very little effort for an applicant to just say, send my resume here, here, and here, and here. Um, when they have to do the video, that increases their investment a lot. It also, for us, selfishly, weeds out people who can't use computers. You know, somebody who can't figure out how to make a, a one-minute video probably doesn't really have the computer skills to work here. So that's, that's a trick we've tried, and it, it, it seems to be working uh, so far, and I, I just throw that out for the for the audience in case that helps them. Yeah, another another thing that is kind of old school is when people will advertise their jobs, they will say, "Please send us a cover letter," and they'll put two or three instructions on in that cover letter and say, "Please do this, this, and this." And if the person can't follow through and follow those instructions, then you know. We believe in a process of elimination when you're looking through resumes is if they can't follow a couple of simple instructions, then, okay, maybe they're not a good fit. Right. Great comment from Dr. C. Uh, you've got all the material for another webinar. My hour is up. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> well, I cannot thank you enough. If there is a part two, we're happy to do it as well and, uh, and truly appreciate David Harris. It's an absolute privilege. And Adrian, every single time staffing issues the difficult conversations uh you're always right in, incredibly caring and give some great uh, best practices there you're so, very kind eric thank you hopefully our clients will reach out same for david and uh, to help help us out there guys and we certainly appreciate it so on that note thank you so much we are here all of our contact details are there there'll be an exit survey as well uh, we certainly appreciate your feedback for anything we can do or new topic ideas for the future. Uh, and if you want to continue to hear some of the war stories and how we got through them, we're happy to do another one as well. Perfect. On that note, Adrian, Thank thanks so much. David, Sheila, have a great night. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye now.